it was it was tough for a short while, and then you 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 know you move on. Um, and I I was lucky. I mean, I've never been precious about the business in that sense, so I didn't feel like it was my life's work destroyed. And you know, it wasn't that. It was more about what a feckin' age that I am to have let this happen, and actually how are we going to pay the mortgage next month. The architects of business with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome to the Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where you will hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Sonia Lennon, broadcasting remotely at this time. And on this week's show, I catch up with the founder of Camille Thai, Brody Sweeney, a serial entrepreneur who built and lost one restaurant empire only to grow another. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe to get brand new shows directly into your feed. Brody Sweeney, thank you so much for joining me on Architects of Business today. I I feel like I'm so ready for this interview. You have a sort of um, mythical property in Irish business uh, as, I suppose, one of life's serious rebounders. Um, your story is amazing. Um, but let's begin at the beginning, as we always do on this show. Just a little bit of... Um, socio-psychological context for where this drive came from. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you, Brody growing up. Well, I'm, I wish I could say I was a right to riches story. I'm not. Um, I grew up in uh, uh, South Dublin. Um, my dad was a lawyer and my mum was a, a stay-at-home mum. And um, yeah, we were a big, kid, big family, seven kids. Uh, a really good upbringing as far as my uh, my memory goes. Um, uh, really interesting. Um, my kids, interestingly, all end, my, my brothers and sisters, interestingly, all ended up kind of not working for somebody else. They're all either self-employed or doing their own thing. And I always thought that was a kind of funny thing. Um, my, uh, we, all, we all obviously went to school. Five of us um, went on to second level. Nobody finished. So it's, a, it's kind of interesting. Apart from, apart from my brother who, didn't, who, who did an apprenticeship as a fitter turner, he qualified. But the rest of us who went to college didn't actually make it true. So uh, I don't know what that says about uh, our upbringing. What, what do you think that came from? That, that must have come from something. Uh, my dad was a very entrepreneurial uh, guy. He was always uh, getting involved in starting uh, businesses apart from his legal practice. So I think we were uh, we were all we all loved starting new things. We got a bit distracted if uh, things went on too long, and that maybe uh, maybe fed through to us. I. I I started my first proper business with, with my dad. He, he, uh, he bought a master franchise for a, for a print shop chain from the UK called Pronto Print. Some, some of the older uh, viewers might remember that. And um, But he, had, he hadn't <laughs> taught through uh, who was going to run it. So I, I was in college at the time um, doing business in what was then the brand new DCU. Um, and uh, so I, I, I more or less begged him to come out of college to, to get that business started. And he, as any parent would, was very reluctant, but eventually uh, caved in and um, yeah, got, uh, got, that got me started. And I actually feel I got my University of Life education from that business, um, which I ran for eight years. Um, and I really got a good grounding in, uh, in kind of how to run a business, but more particularly how not to. Um, which has stood me a good can I just uh, can I just ask you was was there a precursor to that in your entrepreneurial story did you did you like all great entrepreneurs start as a child before that well I I'm, I mean others might say I wasn't a great entrepreneur really but I did <laughs> actually uh, I did yeah I mean I started a, a first kind of proper business at, at kind of 15 during the summer holidays uh, cutting down trees uh, in Kalini, where we were we were brought up. We had uh, we had a chainsaw, I remember, and a, a friend of mine uh, printed up business cards, and uh, and off we went. And to our shock and horror, we got a, a big job, um, which uh, which we did that summer. It, it didn't end well. Um, we knocked, we managed to, to uh, knock a tree down across the Vico Road, which the fire brigade had to come and chop up, and then there were questions asked about insurance and that kind of thing. And um, so, yeah, so I, I had a I had a business each summer, really, uh, during school. So, um, yeah, I'd, I, I, you know, I've never had a job, never had a proper job, um, and so I've always done my own thing. Arguably, completely unemployable now. And if, indeed, when my O'Brien's uh, business went into a sandwich, that was one of the uh, one of the dawnings on me at the time was that I actually was unemployable at that age because I never worked for anybody else. 
Well, we'll come to that in a little minute. I, I'd love to hear from you um, after your eight years in Pronto Print. What were the takeaways? You said you'd learned how not to run a business. Uh, what well, did you bring with you? Yeah, I think that, I think franchising, which I've been in all my career, is a really great way for a young person to start in business because it, it touches an all the business, business disciplines. So, so when we think of business, we think of under four headings. So finance, marketing, operations and HR. That pretty much encapsulates most businesses which are incredibly complex but they all, they all kind of come under those four headings so I learned that um, and I learned uh, I learned how to build a brand up uh, from uh, from scratch and I learned about dealing with people because in franchising it's it's really primarily about relationships and uh, in a sense it doesn't matter what your legal agreements say if the relationships aren't great um, so I learned uh, I, I learned about that and you know the business that business I had for eight years never really made any money, um, but I I was uh, I was kind of learning as I went along, and so by the time I got onto my my second uh, business, which was O'Brien's, um, I was able to take those eight years of learnings and do a better job of it. So so tell us about the 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 moment that the second business um, began. Um, yeah, uh, so it's uh, uh, I was operating uh, obviously Pronto Print. My dad died. Uh, this is around 1988, um, and I decided to uh, to shift on and do something else. So, um, so uh, at the time, older uh, viewers again might remember the sandwich market in Dublin was very simple. Um, sandwiches came in in three flavors. Um, they were wrapped in cling film, sat on top of a news agent's counter, and they came in ham or cheese and or you could get ham and cheese together and that was kind of the that was kind of what sandwiches exotic. were like <laughs> exotic yeah um <laughs> so uh, a friend of mine had set up a sandwich bar down on, on marion row a um, really gorgeous sandwich bar but not, he wasn't great at the business side of it and that really inspired me to uh to uh to set the business up and at the very beginning um we were making sandwiches to order which was completely new in Ireland at the time and then to kind of get a USP on them um, I had gone to Johnson Mooney who were our bread suppliers at the time and got them for the bread they were baking for us to take every second toot out of the saw that they were cutting up the sliced pans with and so we ended up with a double tick slice and that was kind of quite different it was it was obviously a big meal in, it, in itself but it gave us a, a kind of a talking point in terms of getting the brand going. Um, yeah, and uh, we started in Georgia Street uh, in Dublin in 1988, um, and uh, you know, very trouble started that too. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, it went through, and it, it became a great business um, over over 20. Tell years. us what was the troubled start. Well, it was just uh, uh, George Street actually wasn't a great location. It was kind of pre-Temple Bar, so it wasn't the best location in the world to, to, to start. So the, the sales weren't that brilliant. Um, we opened a second restaurant, uh, a second sandwich bar in what was then the brand new St. Stephen's Green Shopping Centre. Tiny units, 203 square feet. It's, it's indelibly seared on my brain the size of that. Uh, because I remember the, um, the health authorities coming in uh, to view us uh, as a kind of restaurant and saying well where are you going to put the toilets mm -hmm. and I remember with 203 square feet that would be kind of the toilets there wouldn't really be much left for a uh, for a shop um, but that was a flyer it just took off like a rocket that one and um, so that gave great comfort but also a bit of cash flow um, and, uh, and so we went on to to open more make kind of more mistakes George Street really wasn't a great location at the time it would be great now and um, so yeah uh, I mean we, I made every mistake going um, Sometimes I was smart enough not to repeat the mistakes, but I, I had to make it first. <laughs> yeah. So at its height, then, what what, what was the pinnacle of the O'Brien's empire? Well, um, around um, I'm just trying to get my mind back. Around 2005, we had 340 um, O'Brien's restaurants in 16 countries around the world. We were we were turning over about 140 million. Um, is uh, is was great fun. I. I absolutely loved it. Um, we had quite a, a chain, as we still do, as O'Brien still do in Asia. Uh, we had a, an office for the region in Singapore, and it was it was great fun. Um, it uh, it was really um, 
gratifying to see in in airports like Changi in Singapore or uh, in Beijing O'Brien's outlets, you know, this positive representation representation of Ireland that wasn't alcoholic and um, and so people you know got to see it and it, it made me very proud. You know, when people come home and say, "My God, I was passing through, you know, uh, um, Kuala Lumpur and came across an O'Brien's extraordinary." So I so that was it was really great um, and the business went really well. I, I kind of semi retired from the business um, around 2000, at the end of 2005. Um, the business was going well then and to do some of the things I enjoyed. So I wrote a couple of books. Um, I stood for election for Fine Gael. I started a charity working in uh, Ethiopia. Um, all great, great, fantastic uh, things uh, to do. But um, around 2008, uh, the business, which I still owned, um, started to feel the effects of the downturn. And um, so I had to come back into the business at that point um, and try and sort it out. And it became clear, you know, around 2009, it wasn't going to be able to be sorted out as it was. Um, we had a model which... Uh, where we had taken all the property leases into our company and sublet them out to our franchisees. And that was not a great model in 2008 uh, to have. And so the business went into examinership in 2009. Um, the examinership didn't work at the time. Um, we were trying to um, get rid of our, our most problematic leases. Um, it was found to be unconstitutional at the time. It was a bit of a bummer because two weeks later, another retailer went in and it was found to be perfectly constitutional. But it was... It was too late for us. So the business then was put into, when the examination failed, the business was put into receivership. Uh, it was taken over by the Abracababra guys, which um, which upset me. That was really the most upsetting part of the whole uh, bit of going out of business because I'd kind of spent 20 years dissing Abracababra and then they ended up taking over the business. So I, I was I was a little bit upset about that. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that was around, that was 2009. And I ended up with the business uh, gone, uh, gone from me. I mean, the business of Brian's has survived fine. It's, it, it's great to see, um, but not my part of it. And uh, yeah, so I found myself um, out, of, out of work, uh, out of my, my kind of notional wealth gone um, and having to start all over again, like a lot of people at the time. And uh, and that was tough for a relatively short period, but I'm an optimist by nature. So I uh, I dusted myself down and, uh, and got going again. Which, uh, <laughs> I'm interested, um, you know, y- you say that you <laughs> practically took three months to feel sorry for yourself, to wallow in it. And it must have been um, such a tough time. I mean, you tell the, to- the story stoically, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge investment in your life um, that, that sort of you're, you're ousted from. Mm. Um, that, that, that period, um, I think, you know, opt- even optimists need time to lick their wounds. Uh, what what was that like for you and, and what did you come away with? Well, look, I'm not different than anybody else who went through a bad time at business. I, it's actually, I always think it's kind of like, it's funny, people always want to talk about this part of, of my life or other, or other people's lives. And for me, it's a bit like a divorce, you know. You know, I, it happened 10 years ago. It was pretty messy at the time, but I don't really like to talk about it. <laughs> it's, you know, Move it's on. <laughs> that part of my life is, that part of my life is over. But, you know, I, uh, you know, lots of people have to do it. Um, lots of people were like me, which was, you know, you're, you're, you're like a cornered rat in a sense that, you know, it's it's not it's not an option to sit in bed you know there's a mortgage there's a big celtic tiger mortgage to be paid um and the kids to be put through school so it's not an option um i was blessed to have uh, a missus my wife lulu um who uh was just a rock at the time and actually had a bit of income coming in which uh, made a big difference um but it's it is just something i think it happens and i don't i think uh, you know my sister lost a child a few years ago. That's much tougher than what I went through. Mm-hmm. Uh, people go through messy divorces. It's tougher. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm blessed by being having an optimistic nature. So yeah, so it was tough for a short while, and then you 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 know you move on. Um, and I I was lucky. I mean, I've never been precious about the business in that sense. So I didn't feel like it was my life's work destroyed, and you know it wasn't that. It was more about what a feckin' age that I am to have let this happen, and actually how are we going to pay the mortgage next month. So. So I suppose, you know, the good thing about failure and it's it's pretty much inevitable if you're going to go into business um, is is that you 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 build those resources, you build that experience, you build that knowledge and you get takeout and you move on. So I suppose after your period of reflection, um, what was the next step? 
Um, so I knew a little bit about franchising, a little bit about food. I had an idea around um, around takeaway foods. I'd always noticed that um, that the two two of the three biggest sectors, which are fish and chips and Chinese have no brands in them and I was always intrigued with that I mean people look at Chinese restaurants even still and you look at them you go that's a business that's so ripe for modernization so you know they and I'm generalizing because there's some very good ones but generally speaking they're poorly designed there's no customer service there's no nice packaging the menus are too long um so no branding so all those things that they don't do I thought I could uh, bring to a new business which I did um and I set that up in 2010 uh, a, a modern version of a Chinese takeaway, it turned into be an utter failure itself. And so I pivoted quickly uh, from Chinese to Thai food. Um, interestingly, I think there's a great business case study for because when I changed from Chinese to Thai food, I put the prices up by 40 percent. And uh, when we changed over, it took off like a rocket and uh, it eventually became Camille and, and yeah, became the foundation of a of a business now, which is coming up towards 40 restaurants. Um, we've got a good position in London. We're, we're way in ahead kind of brand leaders mm-hmm. in Ireland and it's a good business, fantastic young management team. I'm so proud of them. And they're all like less than half my age. Um, I feel like a grandfather with them. Um, <laughs> it's just such a, there's such a gap, but a, you know, an amazing team. Um, um, doing doing incredible work, really ambitious, really hungry uh, to to move the business along now, and we seem to have found a really nice niche for ourselves in a in a sense of being a technology led restaurant business. So so we're you know we're doing huge business, more than half our sales to our own proprietary app uh, we've developed, which is uh, is wonderful. We're into robotics now in our kitchens. We're the launch partner for Mana with uh, with their drones, and we've a huge pipeline. Like you know, the well, pandemic. I'm, I'm going to come to yeah. that because yeah. all of that is fascinating, and that needs a little bit more discussion but I'd love to start with the birth of a brand so uh, you know again to say uh, you're a businessman uh, who brings so much experience to the table at this stage how did you begin um, to to position Camille to create Camille and and to create a, a brand which is so well known now yeah, it's uh, well, it's uh, great to say to say it's so well known because actually it's fairly well known in Dublin and it's not that well known anywhere else. Um, so the name we 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 came up with through Survey Monkey. Survey Monkey. I had a different name for it. It wasn't my choice, but this was like a a, a name put in just to kind of make up the numbers. Um, and so when it was a clear majority in favour of Camille, and when we mm-hmm. when we um, figured that out. Um, uh, I realized Camille is a French name for a boy or a girl, um, and I've, it's spelled with two L's. I figured out if you took one L out of it, we'd be able to make that into a trademark, which we did. Um, and then in in my middle-aged, late middle-aged now, male way, um, we imagined who Camille was. So um, so Camille, in our mind, we invented this character. So Camille was 25, she was half Asian, she was half European, she was gorgeous, she was tall, she was beautiful, great crack, loved her food, and um, was into kind of sustainability in a bit in a bit of a way. So we imagined this character we called Camille, and then we designed a business and a brand that would reflect her personality in, I'd say, my late middle-aged male way. And um, so we looked at, you know, what would Camille like to eat? You know, having this firm picture in her mind so we knew she'd probably like to see the calories but she'd ignore them then and she'd she'd like some vegan because she's kind of she'd be into that kind of thing and she'd be into sustainability and she'd night she'd like packaging that looked pretty on her table it didn't look like shit you know so that she uh so we, so we thought about the restaurants what would she what sort of restaurant would she like to come into so we're a you know in fast casual space so people aren't going for their anniversary dinner so can we get in and out quickly can can we take the guilt away that often you associate with takeaway and the big change that's happened in our lifetime Sonia is that you know when I was when I was 18 or 25 you know a takeaway was once a month on the way home from the pub and you didn't feel terrible about it because it wasn't very often mm-hmm. uh, 25 year olds now living in cities are having takeaways in inverted commas three or four times a week not once a month and so and they're doing that because they're you know they are spending way too much time on their screens so there's less home home time they're just they just have busier lives and so so takeaways when i was 25 were you know um not very good not very high quality tacky shop fronts all the things you associate with bad takeaways antisocial behavior litter on the streets all that kind of stuff the modern version of that doesn't doesn't have that so we realized as as people were eating this food three or four times a week in london or dublin that we could give them some healthier options and so 
So if you're in living in rock mines, for example, now you have on, on a platform like Deliveroo, you have 250 restaurants who will deliver to you within half an hour from the truly awful to the really good. So you can, you know, if you want to eat vegan, you can. If you want to eat macrobiotic, you can. If you want to, all those choices are available to you now. And we just slotted in. We, we knew that reputation for the takeaway sector was that kind of guilty one. And we said, well, let's flip all that on its head. So with our packaging, let's not make crappy packaging. Let's, let's make compostable packaging. Let's put, you know, decent ingredients in. So if it's a beef dish, it's Irish sirloin steak, it's um, it's fresh vegetables, it's sauces we made ourselves with no funny stuff in them. Um, let's educate people about what's in them so they can make choices. So let's show them what the calories are so um, you can decide what you want to do. One of our big successes in the last couple of years has been putting on free yoga classes in the city park so we had 8,000 people came through last year and um, free yoga classes in Marion Square and St. Anne's and uh, Bushy Park um, so it's, it's really interesting because I think I think that the consumer um, is entering a sort of a golden age of respect from everybody who serves them uh, and uh, you know it, it's something that I I believe in in my business as well it's where can you add additional value and that's very much uh, along those lines but I think you know that that's all wonderful and that's all part of the brand build it it must be incredible to think that you were already at the start of an s curve uh, when all this was being built and then the biggest s curve of them all covid hit and and you were you were primed for for a, a brand new phase of the business yeah and it's extraordinary the way it happens because I have a lot of friends and associates who are in hospitality and are having a miserable time. It's, it's just I, my heart goes out to them. Uh, and just by luck and I, you know, it's just by accident we decided to set up a business that focused on home delivery. So we are located primarily in suburbs where people are living. Um, we have hardly anything in city centres or, or shopping centres. Um, and before the pandemic hit, we were we were over 70% of our business was off premises. So mostly home delivered. So, uh, so and, and Brody, can I ask you, was, was the out of shopping center and out of city, uh, strategic, yeah, uh, financial? Totally. No, totally strategic. I mean, um, an inspiration for our business is Domino's pizza. And, um, so we, I mean, at the very start, we just looked at where they were going and that we, we noticed that they weren't going into city centers or shopping centers. Um, so our, our business is serving, people a hot evening meal at home that's our primary business so so we put them in the middle of chimney pots basically in the middle of, of a bunch of chimney pots so our whole strategy was actually to stay away from the centre uh, so if we think of London you know we, we never had any interest in going into the city or the West End or out in the kind of outer suburbs um, and that's absolutely was the right strategy for us but it's proven the right strategy in the pandemic people spending a lot more time at home um, and it and they're living in the suburbs, the, the centres, you know, Canary Wharf, um, the West End of London, they're empty. I was there last uh, week. Uh, I'm self-isolating uh, since I came back, but I had a meeting on New Bond Street, which is just off Oxford Street. And New Bond Street's boarded up. It's it's incredibly sad. <laughs> and going through Gatwick Airport with the North, uh, South Terminal's closed entirely. And the North Terminal is like, uh, it's just like a mausoleum. mausoleum. It's, it's incredible, the impact on these traditional industries that's uh, come out of this. And we have just by accident been in a space that's been the right space to be. And in fact, I'd argue that if you were designing a, a, a food business for the pandemic, you'd design Camille, that this is, this is perfect. So we, it's perfect. yeah, we held, held our own during the lockdown and we've had a, a substantial rise since then. In London, um, we have six restaurants and and we're we're well ahead of what we were doing last year. I mean, it's it's gone from kind of uh, you, you know coming along nicely. It's actually it's working fine now. So, what what percentage of growth are you seeing in your business now over this period? Uh, so we're in London. We're tracking about forty percent ahead of last year in on like for likes, and in Ireland over twenty percent. So. Um, so it's, and that's way more than we would have expected in a normal year. So Brody, you you said yourself you're you're a long game man, uh, you're a strategic man, uh, you are a process man, and so this um, sort of fascination with new technology is at the core of of your strategy. I can only assume. 
Yeah, it is. Um, it's um, you know, technology is a huge enabler for uh, for business like ours. So, for example, um, like most of our customers are spending their lives on screens, and so they're choosing uh, to a large extent to interact with the world through their screens. So, we got that from the very beginning, ten years ago, um, that we needed to have a good app. We needed to be able to sell online really uh, easily. So. So we took that on board. It wasn't a kind of a late thing for us. We built it right into it. And um, food businesses uh, around the world are one of the last bastions of high labor um, uh, businesses that haven't had any real automation. So in nearly every restaurant business, it's it's entirely manual, uh, the process. So we got thinking about ours, uh, our business in particular, which is, you know, um, cooking, you know, preparing food, cooking it on a walk, packing it and dispatching it. And uh, could we take, uh, could we reduce the amount of labor on, on the cook line? Um, and redeploy those staff into something else. One of the interesting things people always ask with robotics, you know, what about the jobs? And if you, actually, if you look at uh, as America or Britain pre the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of a lot of automation and very low unemployment. So people get redeployed into other areas uh, of business, uh, which is great. So we we can see we can take labour out, um, and we have to because one of the things that was didn't exist when we started were these aggregators like Deliveroo and Just Eat. Um, a lot of people choose to interact with restaurants through those. We hate them. Um, uh, because they charge crazy commissions and it's very hard to make money. But if they are a reality and we have to accept that they are for a lot of people, then we need to find other ways to save money. So robotics uh, being one of those. And a third one um, is drones. So we're working with Bobby Healy's company, MANA. Um, drones are just, uh, first of all, they're they're very real and they're going to be with us very soon. Um, but they're extraordinary in the sense of, um, firstly, making it cheaper for us. So it's going to be, we think about half the price of doing a, a delivery um, with a conventional driver. And again, they, they can be redeployed somewhere else. Um, it's going to be quicker for you as a consumer. So if you're ordering from us and um, and uh, uh, you want to get delivery, it'll go straight to your house at 80 kilometers an hour in 95% of weather conditions. And there's no traffic, there's no roadworks. It just goes there straight so quicker for you. And finally, it's environmentally friendly. So instead of sending a three-ton car, we're sending a battery-powered uh, drone, which is taking traffic off the road. It's got virtually no carbon footprint. So it's all those things you just go, why would you not love that? So talk me through the experience. I've ordered my delicious Camille meal and uh, it's droning its way to me. What happens? Well, so when you make your order first uh, through our app, we'll send you back a Google Earth image of your house and um, with a grid overlaid in it. And you'll pick a square you want the food dropped into. So it might be in your front driveway or your outside your rear door. Um, so the, we, we cook the food, load it into the drone, which will live in a 20-foot shipping container at the front or the back of a restaurant. 20-foot shipping came was a little bit bigger than a car parking space, but it's that kind of size. Um, so we load it into the drone, takes off to 400 feet, flies directly to your house. When it gets to your house, it hovers over the square, sends you a text message asking you, are you ready to receive it? You say yes. The drone comes down to 40 feet. And a little door opens underneath it and the food comes down on a string, which is biodegradable, very important. And the, <laughs> and the string then unravels from the drone and just falls down on top of the food. And the drone goes back up to 400 feet and flies uh, flies back to base. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you you have been part of the EY alumni uh, throughout this whole process. The, it, it, it must be, uh, you know, a great support to you to know that all the other pirates in this ship have been through the the same ups and downs. Yeah, it it, it yeah, it's great. It's a long time since I did it. Um, since I was involved in it, it's 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 probably twenty years ago. Um, I I I was I wasn't here at the time, and I don't think it was as big a fuss. There certainly wasn't any kind of fancy foreign trips or anything like that. Um, I think I was in in Singapore at the time, and um, I got the news that our we'd been beaten by a guy with a horse blanket, and I remember being kind of <laughs> really. <laughs> I have a horse blanket, which was a great business, actually. I think it's called Horseware. Um, more recently, my wife, Lulu, uh, she was a finalist last year. So it's kind of rekindled um, my interest. She's uh, She goes to everything, does everything, absolutely loves it. It's a brilliant support. Um, I'm uh, I'm less engaged, but um, I know it's great to uh, to have that uh, kind of network of people uh, behind you. And there is something about this, this kind of uh, exclusive club where... You know, we've all been through the, the process of, of setting up a business. Anybody who's made it to finals had a lot of highs and lows in their uh, career. And so it is, a, it is a comfort, but also a practical knowledge there of 
being able to talk to people who've been through the same thing. Running a business is very lonely. I always think, in the sense um, of you, you know, when you're when you're running your own your own thing, it's it's you know you often have challenges or problems you don't really know how to deal with, um, and and so you think you're the only one who's having that problem. And um, so having that network of people you can call on just to bounce things off in a you know in a non-judgmental way is great. So is is the business that you've created now? Um, do you feel it lives in a genre of its own as a low cost franchise? Um, well, we have a low cost franchise option, but actually, you know, the mainstream franchise is not cheap. So you're talking about an investment of 300, 400,000 to set up a standard Camille. We developed a new uh, idea during the pandemic as a response to the fact we knew a lot of restaurants and hotels were in trouble. Um, and so we said, we said, you know, could we could we go into your existing kitchen and convert it to a Camille? And, and so you could set up a delivery service, delivery and collection service without the investment. Typically, we would make in the front of house or, you know, typically we go into a building and build it from scratch. So you've got to put into toilets and the electrics and the uh, and the ceiling and the plumbing. And so in an existing restaurant or uh, an existing pub or bar or hotel, they've already made that investment. So we had the idea of of changing that around so that we could um for a very low cost get them into the community business um and the, the ones we've done have been really successful it's 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 a real pain point obviously for a lot of businesses uh, uh in hospitality at the moment so they're you know they're uh, the footfall is gone from outside their, their premises government restrictions say they can't operate you know bring people onto the premises and um, so we're we say well look you don't have to rely on people coming onto premises we can do home delivery and and take out uh, as well so it's been a real lifeline for some of the businesses we've been involved uh, with already but we do think we're in a different genre so you know takeaways you know and uh, fast food have been around for years we think we're more like a restaurant that delivers it's that standard of food um, and that's kind of a new space so typically restaurant uh, businesses are in you know you know Domino's is fast food and um, McDonald's is fast food big chains tend to um, uh, in our space be have that kind of lowest common denominator feel we think we're doing a, a more of a restaurant quality um, it's better for you it's less processed food um, and so that's I think that's a new space and we're really excited about it because we can't see a Camille type of business not only in Britain, but we can't see one in the States either or in Asia. So the opportunity is incredible for us and for our young management team um, to really take this, uh, to really take this and bring it on. And it's kind of crazy because you look in London, you know, it's a it's a Thai food business owned by Irish people, run primarily by Indians in London. Like it's it's nuts. Uh, Brody, you started this business uh, thinking big, and I have no doubt that it is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks for listening and watching Architects of Business, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to the whole team here at Joe, and of course to our entrepreneur today, Brody Sweeney. If you haven't already done so, click subscribe and never miss a show.